bank it ahead. Konechny tips it. He got it past the defenseman and gets to the puck. Konechny cutting it on goal. He scores! A beauty from Konechny! And the Flyers take a 1-0 lead. Beat the defenseman, then beat the goaltender. And then Konechny's third goal in the last two games has the Flyers on top. Period.com presents the OMB Puckcast, episode number 69. The Flyers rule nine in a row. And wow, we got a stack show for you tonight. I'm your host, Isaiah. I'm Dan the Flyer fan. And I'm Chef B. All right. Yep, the Flyers have won nine straight, outscoring opponents 39 to 17 during that stretch. And Carter Hart's on fire. He improved to 7-0, and dating back to February the 18th. Became the first goaltender in NHL history to record multiple win streaks of seven-plus games at the age of 21 or younger. And, Dan, what do you do with a stat like that? I mean, that's a, that's a stat geek's geeky stat if there ever was one. It's uh, certainly impressive, that's for sure. Yeah, and, and you know, Chef, uh, since his injury, uh, Carter Hart has had a 9.33 save percentage and a, another advanced stat, his goals saved above expectation has gone up by about, I guess that would be 5%. So he, we're getting the best Carter Hart probably we've ever seen in the, this small stretch. Could be the best best we've seen in his uh, NHL career so far. And the good thing is he's heating up at just the right time. Uh, and before, you know, they always say that uh, you, you go as far as you go in the playoffs with a goalie, and we might have one this time. Yeah, I sure hope so. The, the idea that we could split anything or have Brian Elliott as any, playing any more than just going back-to-backs and maybe – once the Flyers have clinched something, uh, to me, just doesn't make any sense. And, you know, that's something that Dave Isaac was talking about last time. It's it's Carter Hart's net. And, you know, in general, the Flyers... Now, this is before the Buffalo game, which was a 3-1 to victory. Not the Flyers' best game, but nobody's complaining these days. Since January the 8th, the Flyers have not lost consecutive games. They've scored an NHL high of uh, 94 goals. I'm adjusting for the Buffalo game. Are tied with the Bru- uh, Bruins for the most points in that interim. They have an NHL best plus 32 goal differential. And they have wins over the Caps, Bruins, Blues, Avs, and Pens. All top seven clubs. And that's three wins, uh, the Caps. So... You know, that's that's quite an interval there. There's a lot of elements to the success. Uh, Dan, what, what's your overall feeling in terms of what they've been able to do and what are some of the keys to their success? Well, we talk about it on, on Brotherly Pod a lot. You know, we had David Pagnotta on uh, probably about a month and a half ago now and before the trade deadline, and he said, plain and simple, your best players need to be your best players. And for a long time, that really wasn't the case earlier in the season. You know, uh, in October, November, the top guys weren't really showing up. And quite frankly, after uh, after that Christmas trip disaster out west, I mean, Jake Voracek's been here. Claude Giroux has stepped up. You know, they've gotten a lot out of pretty much every single player on the roster has come to play. And, you know, we've seen it when guys 
go down, you know, uh, go on a stretch where they're not necessarily great, somebody else comes in and steps up. You know, Giroux scored against Buffalo after going cold for a couple games. Voracek has been, you know, dishing them out left and right. The defense has been solid. The goaltending has been good. You know, everybody has played their role to a T right now, and that is why they've been so dominant since early January. Yeah, I mean, Voracek has 10 points in the last five games, all of them assists. Nobody's complaining. You know, the... uh, the hockey news chef came out with an article looking at the Flyers uh, compared to last year. And, you know, five on five, they have a 3% increase in the Corsi that shots for, and um, almost a 3% increase in scoring chances, almost a 2% increase in expected goals. I mean, this all you know, kind of points toward what's been going on in contrast to last year with the additions Chuck Fletcher made and the the AV effect. Give me a, a little bit more in the way of stats. The Flyers ranked 9th, 10th, and 12th, and 16th in those categories. The, one, the stats I gave you, as compared to last year, they were 21st, 23rd, 22nd, and 18th. So, I mean, they're really doing a lot better job. And I just talked about how hot Carter Hart has been. And it just, our our old colleague, our part-time colleague, Anthony DeMarco, talked about how, you know, you have to look at Chuck Fletcher maybe for executive of the year. Oh, almost definitely. Uh, and and Av as a coach, he's got to be he's got got to be up there in consideration too. I mean, like we all say, elite players around the league and all this, and like the Flyers have a lot of really good players, like Dan said, playing to their potential right now. And in a system that Av brought here, I mean, the defense Dan touched on that briefly is stable. It wasn't. It was erratic last year. You have flashes of good stuff, and but people revert back to their own, you know, their their bad habits or bad mistakes. And this, like Niskanen and Braun, you know, uh, which were Panda's eh, signings, have really come to stabilize this 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 defense and really, you know, paved the way for Sandheim and Myers to like grow and not have all that pressure just be on them. But the most important thing I think is now, and we can attest to this last year, the third period has been 100% better. I mean, when the Flyers, how many times, I, I don't look at it now. If they're up by like three, three to three to one or like or five to two, I'm not worried that the other team's going to come back like I did last year. I'm not sitting on the edge of my, my seat. I'm waiting for this team to shut down other uh, – to shut down their opponents, and they're doing it. They're a great third-period team, and I think that'll bode well for them in the playoffs. Yeah, no, I, I that's one thing you, I really agree with there in particular is the fallback into bad habits. And that was something, Dan, that Chuck Fletcher talked about in the offset, you know, in the offseason, mindset and habits, and just – yeah, uh, something else, more numbers, this is from uh, Charlie O'Connor, comparing the win streaks from 17 and 19 and this particular streak, we all can see with our own two eyes that this team is playing and has earned these nine victories. Okay, maybe eight. Maybe Carter Hart was the one who, who earned the victory versus Buffalo. But nonetheless, when you look at like shots for an ex- even strength expected goals for compared to those other streaks, the Flyers are like way a- ahead of the game. And, you know, these numbers back up what we've been seeing. This one feels much better, much uh, more positive than the last one did. Last one, I believe they won three or four really good games and they stumbled through their next six. They were just happy to pick up wins or something along those lines. And, and this one didn't feel like that. The Sabres game got a little rocky there. But for the most part, I mean, this has just been continuing the pace of the season, which has just been, you know, flat out dominance, essentially. And um, again, it's all the pieces working together at the exact same time that have caused this. And it's a perfect thing to see right before the the playoffs start in, you know, three and a half, four weeks, because this is the kind of play you're going to expect from them, you know, come June. Yeah, absolutely. And, uh, gents, we're going to have Amy Johnson from 
the AHL report, the Flyers report, and Rocket Sports joining us momentarily. But Dan, why don't you run down uh, some the relevant standings for the Flyers? And I'm not really even concerned about the wild card now. You know, where do they stand in, with you know relative to? the Caps and Pittsburgh, and maybe talk about some games remaining and in, you know, with regard to those teams. Well, the Flyers and Capitals are tied essentially for first place in the Metro. Uh, their exact same record at 41, 20 and seven uh, for 89 points. The Capitals play tonight. So if they would lose in regulation, according to Sam Carcitti, if they lose tonight in Buffalo in regulation, the Flyers would have the tiebreaker and would technically be in first. Obviously, that would then the ball would be in the Flyers' court then to beat Boston tomorrow night. Uh, the Penguins fall back a little bit here. There's a five-point difference between the Flyers and Penguins. All through 68 games, uh, Washington as well as Pittsburgh all have, uh, and the Flyers all have 68 games. 39 wins, 23 losses, 6 overtime losses. So they have uh, quite a few more uh, uh, regular regulation losses, easy for me to say, than the uh, Flyers or Capitals. So they are falling back. So the Flyers have managed to put at least a little bit of room between uh, uh, them in third place. And like you said, them in the wild card spot. They're uh, 8 points ahead of the Blue Jackets for the first wild card spot. So it's at least a good thing to see that they have put some distance between them and them. Obviously, the Flyers have their huge week coming up with Boston and Tampa. Uh, looks like the Capitals play the Sabres tonight and the Red Wings on Thursday. So, you know, different end of the spectrum there as far as difficulty goes. And the Penguins this week play the Devils and Blue Jackets. Yeah, yeah. And, and you know, the, the Capitals have been kind of like a 500 team their last 10 games. A couple little losing streaks, a couple winning streaks. Penguins, like, they they lost, what is it, six in a row. Then they won two in a row, and then they lost another uh, two in a row. So they're two and eight in their last ten. And, you know, they've had to integrate a lot of players, Chef. That's, you know, this, is, this speaks to the trade deadline and the teams that, you know, get the good grades on the day after the trade deadline aren't always the ones that will benefit from that. Yeah, it, it, at the trade deadline, you saw a lot of Flyers fans craving for a huge move. One, we know fiscally that wasn't possible with this team. And two, uh, they were playing well. So less is more sometimes, and in this case, it's – it's kind of worked out. I mean, uh, Grant and Thompson have been nice additions. It gives them more depth. And that, that kick pass the other night was just amazing from Grant. That was just unbelievable. But yeah, yeah, it, it goes to show it's not always you can't just take, like, some high start player, throw them into something, and it's not always going to work out. It's it's not always going to – it's got to be the right fit for the for the team at the times. And I think Fletcher uh, realized this, that, you know, when the players came to him and said, you know, you, you can do something to help us out here, and he did. He gave them that center depth that they so desperately needed, and uh, they gave them a chance to make a run. Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, one of the other things that's really helped the Flyers – this year is the record against the East, 39-5, and five, and particularly against the Metro, 16-4-4. and four. These numbers are going to help them as they move toward a playoff drive. Even from a league-wide perspective, the Flyers are in the top third for most of the following categories. Goals for, goals against, power play, penalty kill, uh, penalty minutes. So I think really when you look at it and, and you just sit back and say, you know, ever since that road trip after Christmas, that seemed to be a pivot point in the season where they really, they really started getting things together. And that harkens back to the discussion about January 8th how they haven't lost consecutive games. And uh, it's really been a pleasure to watch this Flyers team. Because, you know, I compared it, uh, Chef, maybe I'll, I'll, I'll go to you on this one. Did the Flyers have that moment? You know how the Eagles a couple years ago, when they won the Super Bowl, 
they went to Carolina on that short week and mm-hmm. they really showed you something. And to me, almost the equivalent of that. I'm not saying the Flyers are going to win a cup, but when they play as 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 well as they did in that back to back versus Washington on the road, which was a war, a playoff style war, and then come home with Carolina and they played so well in that game. That was to me a, a line in the sand that marked this team as one that could do some damage in the playoffs. Yeah, I mean, I don't know about you guys, but when we were where they were coming up two day, a day before, you know, people around my work they're all asking, "Well, what do you think? What do you think, Chef? What about the Flyers?" I said, "I'm more worried about the Carolina game than I am worried about the Washington game." <laughs> Because the Carolina game was more like a trap, play down to your kind of play down a little bit, but there's I realize they're still in it. But I knew that they would come out juiced for that 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 uh, Capitals game, and you know a lot of people thought uh, I agreed with like the idea of starting Elliot, and they, they thought I was crazy. I'm like, no. I remember a lot of people were like, oh. I'm like, dude, just let it play out. This is ding. And it turns out, you know, that it was it was the right call. You get a good solid game out of them. He let a couple, maybe he could have had one back, but that's the point. That was the turning point right there. And when they sealed that game against uh, Carolina, that I just I was like, all right, the, the the team's for real because you're always waiting for that other shoe to drop. That I don't want to say drink the Flyers Kool Aid, but I'm here now. I, I'm uh, this is the, as Dan said, this is. Demaya, he tweeted it out. It was the best, most fun he had watching a Flyers game in years. They, they were terrific. Uh, Dan, any thoughts about that back-to-back, which I highlighted? I mean, it's it proves that they can handle anybody, right? And and like like Jeff said, the Hurricanes game was much more of the trap variety than uh, than uh, the Capitals would have been. But you know, I I, I was not. Totally thrilled they went with Elliott against the Capitals, mainly just because I think getting Hart some road experience would be the way to go at this point. But you know, at the end of the day, when they win both games, it's you know the, the points moved anyway. So you know, overall, it's just been uh, great. You know, I, this has been like Chef was saying. I tweeted out, "This is the most fun I've had watching the Flyers in I don't even know how many years. It's been probably since the 2012 playoffs, 2012? maybe the 2010 run. But yeah. uh, man, I just as far as regular season hockey goes, this is just it's it's great." It has been great. And, you know, you've been getting contributions all throughout the lineup. So uh, we're going to get back to some Flyer-specific uh, conversation. Just a couple things I wanted to mention real fast before we bring uh, Amy Johnson on another good, a great discussion we're looking forward to about some of the phantoms you, whose names you've been hearing and maybe some wonder, ones that are a little bit below the radar. But uh, Dan, just wanted to get your thoughts about some league news, particularly uh, Bobby Ryan returning to Ottawa after seeking help. I think he had a uh, a substance problem. Perhaps it was alcohol. Uh, were you, you know, did you get a chance to see some of that film and some of his interview uh, interview tape? I saw the goals against the Vancouver game, I believe it was, when he had the hat trick. And uh, it's obviously a great story, you know, when somebody can come back and uh, and produce. You know, he's kind of at this point in his career, kind of in the twilight, I believe he's uh, in his early 30s. I think he's 32, 33. So, you know, how much more hockey does he have left under his belt? I don't know. And obviously, you know, the contract and the team he's playing for is all big you know, biggest stories for a long time, but for him to come back uh, and overcome a personal issue like that and then get a hat trick, it's a great story. Yeah, it was really, really great. Wish uh, Bobby Ryan all the best. He's got he he signed at seven point uh, two five million uh, through the twenty two season. Yeah, he's thirty two, and it's probably his last big contract. And maybe with with some of these issues out of the way, he can be uh, a, a situational scorer comparable to maybe Kovalchuk later. But we just have, you know, we, it's one day at a time, one step at a time for Bobby Ryan. But it, it, seeing him on the bench and, and the fans appreciating his effort, what he'd been through is is one of the reasons uh, I love this game so much. Yeah, that was a story throughout the league. And I, I just wanted to mention also the passing of Henry, or he might be called in French, Henri Richard, 
of the Montreal Canadiens. He passed away at the age of 84 this week, and uh, he, I think he uh, has more championships than any hockey player with 11, and he shares that uh, he shares that distinction with uh, Bill Russell of the Celtics. And I'm just going to give you a, a, a thumbnail sketch of uh, what I remember when I first started following the game of Andre Richard, who they called the Pocket Rocket, and that might have been an out-of-town nickname, uh, according to Dick Irvin, famous from Hockey Night in Canada, that might have been invented uh, in Toronto or thought up in Toronto. Now, of course, his more famous uh, brother was Maurice the Rocket Richard, uh, Henri was more of a below the radar, along the lines of a Couturier kind of player, and, and he was a Swiss Army knife. He could score if you needed him to score. And he was good defensively. You could leave him out there in all situations. And I remember him particularly in 1971 when the Canadians played a seven game series versus the Blackhawks for the Stanley Cup, and a lot of subplots there. Each game was uh, dominated by the home team throughout that series. And Al McNeil, the coach of the Montreal Canadiens, was not getting getting along with the French players. And the players kind of rallied together against the coach. And it was one of those type of situations. And in Game 7, the Hawks looked like they were playing true to script. It jumped out to a 2 to nothing lead. Uh, somebody when a Canadian scored, I have to confess, I do forget. But the tying goal and the winning goal were scored by Henri Richard. And um, it was uh, one of the early moments in my uh, life as a hockey fan. As I was rooting for Chicago because I love Bobby Hull, who was still on the Blackhawks at that time. And Tony Espinzito was Phil's brother and all that. But... The Canadians kind of won me over, and I was rooting for them by the end. And it ended up being John Bellavo's last game. So he went out a champion as well. So so many great names. The Canadians were the Yankees and the Celtics of their day. And I think, really, there's no domination of sports like that. And we'll probably never will see anything like that again. So... Um, Henri Richard, uh, dead at 84. May he rest in peace. So, and with that, we're going to take a little break and we'll be right back with Amy Johnson from the AHL report. And are we on with uh, Amy Johnson from the Flyers report, the AHL report, and Rocket Sports? I believe you are. How uh, are you guys today? Oh, uh, fantastic. Amy, you're on with Isaiah, and I'm also here with uh, Chef and Dan. We have really looked forward to getting a comprehensive review with somebody who watches a lot of uh, the Phantom players and is familiar with the AHL as much as you are. So we're thrilled to have you on. Yeah, I'm I'm thrilled to be here. I'm I'm honored that you guys asked me to to come on and uh, talk about the Flyers and their prospects. And uh, yeah, I, I'm I'm really happy to be here. So thanks for having me. Yeah, uh, great to have you. So uh, let's get right to it. Uh, I wanted to start with some maybe under the radar players, and one guy that comes to mind uh, is Maxime Shushko, if I'm pronouncing that uh, correctly. You are. And tell me about his game, what he's been like from the beginning of the year, and has he progressed, and so on and so forth. Well, you know, f folks who don't have the opportunity to watch the Phantoms as perhaps often as they'd like might be surprised to hear that a guy like Maxim Sushko, which is not a name you hear thrown around all that often, as you say, he's kind of under the radar, uh, that in his 52 games played th this season, um, this young man has 11 goals and 10 assists on the season and is a plus seven. So not a, uh, not so under the radar when it comes to the stat sheet and for what he does for Scott Gordon's team. Um, he hasn't necessarily been scoring as frequently lately. Um, he's, he can be a little, uh, come and go as far as getting on the score sheet, but the one person who really likes how this guy plays 
is Scott Gordon. Uh, the last uh, one of the last times that I that I spoke with Scott Gordon, uh, he was talking about uh, some of the youth movement. Movement. We were talking about guys like Morgan Frost and Isaac Ratcliffe, and Scott Gordon himself inserted Maxime Sushko into that conversation and said, "Look, like Sush is just." a dependable kid who has really good hockey IQ and he's, he's a good setup guy. He, he, he knows the game really well. And in addition to perhaps being under the radar for fans, he's a little under the radar on the ice too, because when you've got, you know, the names like the Bunnemans and the Frosts and sometimes the Farabees and, and the Ratcliffs out there, those kind of, those guys get distracted as the offensive distracting as the offensive producers. Um, and Sushko's able to really get in there and get around and kind of fly around guys and get into position and be able to pull the trigger really quickly if one of his line mates is is able to set him up. So I I think Maxime Sushko has uh, some decent upside, probably as you know a top six AHL player eventually. I don't know that he'll I don't know that he'll make the jump to the NHL per se. He might earn himself a look at some point, um, but Scott Gordon really likes this kid, uh, and I th- I think he's got a lot of uh, positive qualities on the ice. So he's more of somebody who who will help the organization at the AHL level, and then maybe uh, at some point he could uh, go further than that. Uh, yeah, exactly. I th- I think that he uh, I think he brings a lot of energy to the team at the AHL level. Um, and as he progresses and as he matures his game, he could be one of those guys that kind of is is almost a bubble player where, you know, he'd be OK to bring up, uh, you know, if, if a guy goes down with injury, maybe he fills in on the fourth line um, just to to help out in that kind of capacity. I don't I don't see him as a necessarily at this point I don't see him as a permanent NHL fixture but that could change um he's a hard worker uh and and he kind of he he's everywhere on the ice uh he's not a, a park and play kind of guy uh and so he's a uh, as I said you know he's got 21 points on the season uh which is for the phantoms and where they're at in the standings that's not too shabby no, no, not at all. And, and you need organizational depth. You need quality players. You can't always bring in these veterans, guys like Greg Carey and you know some of the guys they had last year. You need to develop uh, from within. That's right. And and frankly, you know, as much as every prospect would love to play in the NHL, a lot of them don't. And so a lot of them eventually. And I'm not. I'm not putting. So just going to this category cemented, but I'm saying in general, a lot of times guys become career AHLers and that's okay too. They're still playing professional hockey. If you're playing top six in the AHL, it's still a very competitive league. It's very difficult to play in. Um, and the a whole idea behind development, yes, is to develop individual aspects of, of different players' games, but also you need to have a good environment for that to happen in. And so you have to have quality guys, as you say, on the depth chart, not necessarily in the NHL, but in the AHL that help, that help build uh, off of each other. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, Chef, uh, you're next on the list there. All right. Uh, how you doing? Uh, Dan has this natural love affair for Sam Moran. So and my, my, my process is Isaac Ratcliffe. Uh, I know he had to, he has to work on his skating and all, but uh, I'm hoping since you mentioned him a couple of times, well, I guess Scott Gordon mentioned him a couple of times uh, and, and higher quality of, uh, of the kids there. Uh, how's, how's his outlook? I will tell you, Isaac Ratcliffe is probably the guy I could spend half an hour talking about. Um, myself and Rick Stevens, who's our editor in chief at the AHL Report and and Rocket Sports, um, we've we've watched Ratcliffe play even back when he was in junior. He was a line mate with uh, Montreal Canadiens uh, rookie Nick Suzuki, and the two of them in junior uh, were just an absolute showcase to watch. I mean, they, there was nothing that could stop the two of them. So uh, we were very impressed with Ratcliffe then. We're still very impressed with Ratcliffe. Ratcliffe is one of those guys, and, and we've spoken to him a few times this season. Every time I talk to him, uh, he impresses us more and more with his off-ice um, characteristics. He is very smart. Uh, he is very down-to-earth. He's very humble, but he is, the most importantly, he is for his age, he is very self-aware. Um, this is a kid who 
was drafted for size and skill. And in this in this day and age, you need to do that because you it, it costs too much money to go out and buy size and size and skill. Mm-hmm. So and and skating ability. His skating is pretty decent for for his size, to be honest. Um, so in junior, he's used to being the biggest guy on the ice. He could push guys off the puck. He had no problem maintaining puck possession because he could win, you know, battles in the corner, battles in the dirty areas because he was the biggest guy. Now he's stepped into the AHL and he's playing against men. And suddenly everybody's the same size as he is and equally strong. And that's where his big obstacle has come that he's and he said he he said directly to me, look, I know. Um, that I need to learn better against these kinds of guys, how to protect the puck and not get pushed off of it. Um, so he's working. He, he last time we spoke to him, he said that he's been spending a lot of time even doing a lot of video work with the coaches, doing a lot of drills, putting in extra practice. And for him, he's one of those guys, you know, fans will look at a stat sheet and they'll say, mm, OK, you know, Isaac Ratcliffe, he's got six goals, nine assists. That's really like it's, I guess, respectable, but we were expecting more. Well, that's okay. You can continue to expect more because Isaac himself said to said to us, look, right now t- to me, the score sheet doesn't matter. I know the small details of my game that I have to work on. And that's what I'm working on putting together. And as soon as those things all come together for me, the points are going to come. So he's not worried about the stat sheet right now, which I think for his age is a very mature uh, attitude to take and a very mature outlook. Um, Scott Gordon speaks very, very highly of him. Uh, He says, you know, he's using his body a lot more effectively, particularly around the net. He's getting better reads with the puck. Uh, He's very pleased with his development so far. Um, In fact, him and and German Rupsoff are are two of Gordo's top two penalty killers. Um, And so that tells you a lot about the kind of trust and responsibility that Isaac Ratcliffe has. So Isaac Ratcliffe has a ton of upside. He's going to be, he's going to be a player that's not, making the jump to the NHL right away. He needs to develop the old fashioned way and come up, come up through the ranks a little slowly. But I think when it all put all gets put together, this is going to be an exceptional hockey player. Yeah. That was like one of my concerns about that was, you know, when he was playing in in juniors, he was basically, it was similar Eric Lindros situation. He was a men among boys. Right. Uh, And I was just more concerned about, like I had mentioned his skating, Eric had a habit of, he never, he never learned to skate with his head up. And that's why he had so many concussions mm-hmm. over the course of years. I mean, is, I mean, how you said his skating's good for a big guy, but ha- have you seen it like take that extra step, that extra leap coming up to AHL level? Well, I, th- I think actually, even at the AHL level, his skating is decent for, for a, a kid that who's, who's six, six. Um, he, there's finesse parts of skating that I think are always going to come a little more difficult, a uh, little more hard for him. But uh, overall, I think his speed is getting better. Um, his bursts are getting a, a bit better. And I think I think the biggest thing for him is making sure that he just doesn't get himself out of position too far that he has to play catch up. He can't if he's chasing the puck, it's going to be it's going to be a lot more difficult for him. And I think those, as he said, those small details of his game, those are the things that are each little thing may 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 not have a huge impact. But all, every one of those little tiny things that he works on, once he compounds them all together, suddenly I think he's just going to break out and, and next year could be the year he's, uh, he, he's going to know more this summer, the things that he really needs to focus on this summer uh, after having a year of pro hockey under his belt. And I think, I think there will be a significant difference in his camp next year. Yeah. You, you know what, who comes to mind when I, I see him, he's not quite as big as uh, Ratcliffe is, is uh, Jason Dickinson of the Dallas stars. I remember Jim Neal talking about him. He's about 6'2", 190. Mm-hmm. But he just didn't have a game. He he was it was a lumbering kind of kid who needed to gain weight. Just they needed to be patient with him. And like you were saying, you can start checking off some boxes in his game and things will everything will kind of fall into line for him. Absolutely. Uh and I I think 
it comes in bursts. Uh, you know, this past weekend, the Phantoms had the dreaded American Hockey League three and three, which is yeah. horrific scheduling, three games in three nights. Um, it was home, away, and home, so they were constantly travel. You know, there was travel back and forth and so forth. The Phantoms have a brutal schedule with that this year. I think they have at least six three and threes this season. Uh, some of them on back to back weeks, which is at just brutal. Um, and so they had kind of an up and down weekend. They had a fantastic game yesterday um, at home against Bridgeport, and Ratcliffe had a goal had one goal and one assist yesterday. So um, it had been a little while since he had been on the score sheet. So it, it comes in kind of fits and starts with him. Uh, and I think the consistency, the more he practices, the more he focuses on that stuff over the summer, the consistency is going to get there. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Dan? Well, you brought up our next name here, German Rubsov, obviously a lot of, uh, you know, uh, potential there to fill a former first overall pick in 2016. One assist in his last 14 games. Is he playing better than his score sheet says? The thing, yes, he is. Um, the unfortunate thing with Rupsoff is, has been his injuries this year. Um, and I think, I think having times where he's been out of the lineup uh, rehabbing and so forth, I think has kind of the stopping and starting isn't always good for him. Um, and yeah, it's, it had been, I mean, he's scored back in the middle of February on the 16th. He had an assist. And prior to that, it, had, it was the middle of January since the last time he had had even an assist on the board. Um, Roops off. I don't know that he'll ever be a big point getter, but his work ethic on the ice is is incomparable and he he moves around like not a lot of players that i've seen um on the pk he's definitely he's definitely lethal on the pk he he's not afraid to go into those dirty areas he is not afraid to get in front of the net he's not afraid to to make his presence known i really like the way german rupsoff plays i think he just needs some time um i think he's gonna come along a little more slowly uh the injuries haven't helped uh, but I think given I think given some time, I think he's going to be OK. Yeah, frustrating player. Uh, you see the, the ability. It just hasn't quite translated yet. And like you said, uh, it just might be a matter of time and staying healthy. That's right. Right. Um, it, well, this is a player that we saw a little bit. He got a cup of coffee with the, the uh, parent club this year, Dobby Kasha. Has he been able to take some of that momentum from his NHL call up? And uh, how's that worked out uh, since that time? <laughs> well, it's funny. It's funny you ask about Kasha because uh, Kasha has, again, had a respectable season. He's got seven goals, 12 assists in the AHL this season so far. He also had a goal uh, yesterday on Sunday. Um, Kasha is one of the happiest guys you'll see in a locker room. Uh, kid, that kid's always got a smile on his face and he plays hockey the same way. He really enjoys what he does for a living. You can tell. Uh, he brings a lot of energy to the lineup. Um, and quite frankly, he was a guy, I, again, my colleague Rick Stevens had last season when we saw him a few times, he was like, that Kasha kid's got some skill. Um, as soon as he gets some confidence behind it, uh, I think that's going to be something. And sure enough, he he kind of broke that out a little bit this year. And as you say, got a cup of coffee with with the parent club. And and I think he's progressing nicely as well. He's becoming a very reliable player for Scott Gordon. Um, he's a guy that, you know, is going to be in the right situations at the right time. And if 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 there's a scoring chance there, he's he's going to find a way for it to happen or set up someone he's he's got a great passing abilities um great setup guy so yes um absolutely the momentum he took the momentum he had with the flyers it's continuing with the phantoms and i i expect you'll see uh i, I expect he'll he'll be up in the show again at some point now do you think that he could be like a like a tweener or like maybe a fourth line guy do you think he could stick or do you think he's destined to be more along the lines of a shushko I would say, oh, that's a good question. Um, definitely, definitely has tweener potential. Um, as far as whether he will stick in the NHL on the fourth line, that's, I think his, his game's going to need a little bit of work. However, 
the things he does on the ice that I know Scott Gordon likes are the same types of things that Alain Vigneault likes. And I could see Vigneault giving Kasha, if, if he had the space on the fourth line, I could see him giving him a shot at sticking. Uh, or even if he started with the Phantoms, let's say next year, and, and there was an injury call up, um, that he might find a way to force Vigneault's hand to stick around. Um, he's got that kind of happy tenacity, <laughs> I guess you could right, say. Right, right. Um, and I, I, th- I think at, at this stage of their careers, I think that Kasha has a better chance of that in the immediate future than Sushko does. Gotcha, gotcha. Uh, Chef? Ustamenko. I know he started in Reading this season and tore it up. Just got pushed up not too long ago to uh, to the Phantoms. Is he going to be uh, anyone to threaten Carter Hart? Uh, he's not going to threaten Carter Hart. That's for sure. Kir- Kirill Ustamenko is an is an interesting case. In fact, the tandem of Ustamenko and Felix Sandstrom in in Reading um, is an interesting duo. Kirill Ustamenko, as you said, yes, in the ECHL with Reading this year, he he had really good numbers, had a couple of shutouts. Uh, he's 19, four and five on his record, a 919 save percentage. He's got decent numbers down there, better, frankly, than Sandstrom's right now. Yeah. However, in the five games that he's played with the Phantoms, he's won three and one with a 384 goals against and an 889 save percentage. Um, now, granted, some of that is because the Phantoms are in a much different position than the Reading Royals are. In fact, uh, the Royals just clinched uh, Kelly Cup playoffs uh, this past weekend. So they will be, the Flyers ECHL team will definitively be on a playoff run um, this postseason. Uh, and so he was playing on, frankly, a team that was winning more often in Reading. Um Reading your numbers in the ECHL, your numbers are also very different because uh, they shoot a heck of a lot more in the ECHL. <laughs> um, they get peppered quite a bit. So he had a lot of ex- a lot of success in Reading. hasn't That hasn't translated to the AHL yet, but it's a little early to tell if that's just because of the kind of inconsistent play that the Phantoms have had overall. Or if it's a if it really is a difficulty jumping up that league, um, you know Alex Lyon needs to have a reliable backup. Um, Alex Lyon is a very good goaltender. Uh, he's he's a very smart goaltender. He's very skilled. He's very talented. Uh, he thinks the game in a way that not a lot of them do. So, in a tandem at that level, Kirill Ustamenko will need to find some consistency. Felix Sandstrom, on the other hand, uh, you know, he's had his struggles as well. But when we spoke to him um, at the end of preseason, the thing to keep in mind um, for Sandstrom, too, is that this is his first year playing North American hockey. Right, so right. he he's spending a lot of time this year getting adjusted to the smaller ice, the speed of the game angles are a whole lot different. Uh, puck comes off the board completely differently. Um, so I, th- I think for me, I think long-term, I think Sandstrom is going to go longer than Ustamenko, but Ustamenko is a pretty fun story right now. So we'll see if he can finish out the season on a positive note. Okay. Uh, Dan. Well, somebody else that the Flyers fans have got to know quite a bit this season, Connor Bunneman who has, you know, had his stint 21 games up with the Flyers. Back down with the Phantoms. Six goals, three assists, so he's obviously not scoring a whole lot down there like he was in the NHL. But is his play NHL caliber? Absolutely. Connor Bonneman, uh, and he was another one that we, when we when we took a look at him last year, uh, he stood out uh, very well uh, in, the, in the few games that he played in Lehigh Valley last year. Connor Bonneman just needs to work on his consistency. He needs to work on his strength. He needs to work on his puck battles. Um, but Connor Bunneman knows how to score and he's, he's, he, he's, he's kind of, uh, the king of the greasy goal. Um, you know, it's, it's not ever going to look super pretty with Connor Bunneman, but boy, oh boy, he works hard. And I think, I think that he definitely, you could see him bottom six in the NHL, um, in the not too distant future, future for sure. Uh, no, his stats down, down in, 
uh, Lehigh Valley don't look great. Um, the minus 21 doesn't help, but again, the phantoms are, uh, uh, the phantoms are struggling to get out of the basement in the Atlantic division. So I don't put as much stock into particularly into plus minus, um, with where the team's at right now, but Connor Bonovan, great attitude, hard worker. And I think the skill is there as well. I, th- I, th- I think he's going to play in the NHL. Uh, Chef, why don't you take the next one? Morgan Frost. Morgan Frost. I know everyone wants Morgan Frost to be, to be the guy. Um, and, you know, at the beginning of the season, it was, is it going to be Frost or Faraby? Frost or Faraby? Frost or Faraby? And the answer was, it was Faraby. And rightly so. Faraby transitioned much more easily than Morgan Frost did. Um, but Morgan Frost is absolutely going to play in the NHL. Um, I think the up and down has been a little difficult for him on the, on the mental side of the game this year. Uh, he might've had some expectations of himself coming out of camp. Um, and so that's always something some players handle it well, um, particularly when they're that age, others, uh, really need some support and assistance from older players and from coaches to to understand that now that you're playing pro hockey, this is how it's going to go. There's going to be ups and downs, um, but he's certainly uh, he's certainly scoring. Um, in fact, this past Friday, uh, he had two goals and an assist. Uh, in a game that they lost on Friday night. Uh, one of those was a power play goal. The, the Phantoms power play has been absolutely dismal of late. Uh, and, and Frosty scored a really nice, uh, really nice one on the man advantage. So he's, he's doing all the right things. I think for him, it's a, it's confidence. I think it's consistency and line mates. Um, when he gets chemistry going with someone that's when Morgan Frost starts to get really comfortable and the ice opens up a lot more for him. Um, His defense still needs work. I think that's a big thing from, from junior um, that separated Farabee from him was, was Morgan Frost's defensive game um, as well as, you know, just his play, you know, his playmaking ability, scoring that kind of stuff. That's not a problem. His skating still needs work. Um, his time without the puck, his positioning, that's, those are the kinds of things and his strength, uh, you know, he really needs to bulk up and I, he's done, he's already done that a bit this season. I think he'll need to work on that this summer, bulking up and, and just being able to, to kind of hold his own against guys that are bigger than, than him. Um, at the beginning of the season, we said, we kind of estimated, you know, it looks like Morgan Frost probably needs to spend the whole year down in Lehigh Valley and just get, get, acclimated to playing against playing this speed against guys this size uh and and find those aspects of his game and put it all together so i expect him to come to camp next fall really determined to make the team whether he does or not still will depend on how much work he does this summer but i i'm not worried about morgan frost now has he played center exclusively in lehigh valley that is a good question. I believe he has. I have not. I I have not watched. I have not seen every single Lehigh Valley Phantoms game, so I can't. I can't say that definitively. But all of the times that I have seen him, he has played center. Um, I don't know if if getting versatility on the wing is something that would be a distraction for him, or if it would be an asset for him. Um, you know, there's guys like you know Nick Aubrey Kubel. You see what he's doing. Uh, with the Flyers now. Um, right. And when he first came down at the beginning of the season, uh, we talked to him when he got sent down and he said, look, you know, um, suddenly I'm, I'm playing on the, on the, on the PK. Um, and no, I'm not used to that, but I need to start doing that down here because I need as much versatility as I can uh, if I'm going to stick up there because finding a spot on the power play is not going to be, is, is going to be, impossible so if if i'm going to be valuable to Vigneault, i need to be special teams valuable that means pk and so i think a guy like albe kubel had the maturity and the age and the experience that he was a bit start started to be able to adapt his game and become more versatile and look a little more um all kind of an all-around hockey player that Vigneault has obviously been able to use and use very well and 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 albe kubel's been very successful with the flyers this season Frost, I don't think, is at a 
position right now. I think he needs to concentrate on the things he does best. We're worried about the versatility uh, once he gets comfortable. Right, right. And 40 games this year, uh, Morgan Frost. In Lehigh Valley is 13 goals, 16 to 6, 29 points. He's a plus one. And I think, you know, Amy, I think with the cloud over Nolan Patrick, I wouldn't blame the Flyers for wanting to, for, for you know, for wanting him to concentrate on playing center and working on some of the mm-hmm. things you talked about, particularly the defense and getting that together at this stage. Mm-hmm. I absolutely agree. I think, um, you know, you need, you need center depth and you need solidified center depth. Um, and so I think they've got enough guys that could, that could play off on the wing um, that, a young, a young kid like Morgan Frost, let let him develop at his natural position and uh, and and get strong there. Yep. I was just going to ask about Joel Farabee. Now, of course, Joel Farabee is back with the Flyers. Yes, he is. And that is well, unlike Frost, uh, Farabee had that experience of playing in the NCAA against mm-hmm. older players. Mm-hmm. playing that reduced schedule, which gave him a little bit of time to build up a little bit, maybe some time that Frost did not have. And I think he had a more mature defensive two-way game to begin with. So I, like you were saying earlier, that, that accounts for why one player is up and why uh, Frost is, is still in the AHL. Absolutely. In fact, uh, you know, you mentioned his NCAA experience. Um, I, I invite you and, and any of, of your listeners to head over to uh, the Flyers Report YouTube channel. You can just search for us at the Flyers Report. Um, and I have a in a in a former life, I was also a television uh, reporter and producer. So once in a while, I pull out my video producing hat. Uh, and we've just published in the last week uh, a video essay feature on Penn State hockey. Um, and the reason I mention it is because in my interview with head coach Guy Godowski, he, I asked him specifically, what is it about playing in the NCAA that has NHL GMs drafting more and more of these guys um, and, and signing more of them right out of, right out of college. And really his answer was, was in a nutshell, the reason why a player like Joel Farabee was ready to step into the NHL this year. And that is, you mentioned they have a much different schedule. They play like two games a week. So yes, gives them plenty of time during the week to get in the gym, watch video, drill, all of those kinds of things. But as coach Godowski also said, um, it creates a situation where every game is almost playoff like intensity. And so suddenly these guys are, pl- they're playing much fewer games every season, but every single one of them has such big consequences that they are so much more ready for the intensity level of the NHL and the compete level of the NHL, because they've had to go out there and do that every single game in the NCAA. And I think that gave Joel Farabee uh, a big edge coming into to this season as well. Yeah, that, there's, there's no doubt that he had a game that was more suited to the NHL. And yet, I thought it would have been better for him had he spent maybe the first 30 or 40 games in a row at the AHL level, worked out some of that mojo that you can, that confidence that you can gain with the puck as an offensive player, because when you, you think about it, guys like Frost and Farabee are going to be counted on to be scoring 50, 60, 70 points every mm-hmm. season in starting with like, you know, in 2022, 2023. And right. it's almost like the development model under Fletcher and this regime is not as conservative as the one under Hextall. Maybe you could speak to that. I would agree with you. Um, Hextall did an enormously good job at drafting and stocking this, stocking the farm system for for the Philadelphia Flyers for years. I mean, the cupboards have been stocked and they're still stocked thanks to Hextall. But yes, he was a little more conservative. He kind of let uh, he kind of let 
prospects percolate a little longer um, before coming up, whereas Vigneault is a, I want results and I want them now. Um, I have been impressed with how much Vigneault has called up prospects this season, particularly in the first half of the season. I mean, ro- roster moves were constant. Right. It was this guy's up for two games, then he's down, then another guy's up for three games, and he's down. Some fans might look at that as make up your mind. I look at it as here's Elaine Vigneault. He comes in. It's a new team. He doesn't – first, he's got he's got all the guys on his NHL roster to get to know but he also has to figure out what he's got coming up on the farm. And so I really liked the approach that he was going to try and he was going to cherry pick and pick and choose and pull guys up and put them in all sorts of situations, not just plug them on the fourth line with a couple of dead weight line mates and see if they're able to make something out of it. No, he called guys up. He put them in their best positions to succeed. And he said, okay, you know, sink or swim. And even if they did well, okay, go back down. Here's some things to work on. I want to see the next guy until he was trying to find the right pieces for his puzzle, but also seeing, okay, what do I have coming? And I, I, I'm okay with that because I think what we saw from prospects when they would come back down to Lehigh Valley was they weren't so down in the dumps, uh, lost confidence. Oh, I got sent down. This sucks. You know, that kind of thing. Right. It was a much more energized um, atmosphere with a lot of those guys because they obviously had a conversation with a land before they came down and they, they would come down determined and energized and say, okay, you know, yeah. Um, I, had a great time in the NHL and I need to work on this, 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 and this to get back up there. Um, and I think that's a very positive development approach. Um, open line of communication is really, really important, particularly with young players, um, that it's not that you're terrible and you're never going to play in the NHL. It's just, here's how we do things around here. Um, and so far I've seen it, nothing but positive this year. Right. Right. And, and the only exception maybe was Morgan Frost had a little bit of difficulty, but that might have been more based on his expectations, which might ha- not have been realistic. That's true. I, I certainly don't think it was for lack of support with um, coaching at either level or right. mentors or anything like that. I think I think he probably I, Morgan Frost is a, is a kid who's used to succeeding. Um, I think he puts a lot of expectations on himself as as most pro hockey players do, um, and some of them just take it a little harder. And I th- I think it just took him a little longer to wrap his head around. Okay, this is how it's going to be, and so I just have to put my head down and keep working, and I'll get that call call up again. Right, right. I mean, one of the concerns I have is is highlighted by what happened with uh, just Barry Kakaniemi of Montreal. He's taken third mm-hmm. overall in the uh, 2018 draft. And he has a, like a 33 or 34 point season. Looks like he's got something to build on. And it's kind of like the pace that Joel Farabee would be at over the course of a whole season in Philadelphia. But he's back down with Laval of uh, the AHL. I guess it's uh, Montreal's uh, farm team. Mm-hmm. That and is, that's yep. that he now he played a year uh, in the Finnish elite league, and that's a you know that's a good experience. I, he's playing against men there, so it wasn't crazy to think he could make the jump, and yet that hasn't worked out for him. And that's one of the concerns I have with this maybe pushing these kids a little too soon into the spotlight. You've you've tapped on an enormous bone of contention for uh, Rick Stevens and I on our podcast and on the AHL report. Uh, for for your listeners who aren't familiar with me, we also uh, we cover the Montreal Canadiens and their AHL affiliate full time as well. Um, and so, when Kakanyemi was drafted, yes, you are correct. He was playing in the Finnish Elite League. His dad was his head coach, by the way. Um, and it was recommend so it was recommended by a lot of people, including uh, just some guy named Saku Koivu, uh, that Kakinemi stay and play one more ye- one more year in Liga right. to get fin- you know get another year under his belt of playing that that with that grit that physicality put some bulk on. Uh, Rick and I even said don't 
put this kid in the NHL his 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 rookie year. Yes, he looks great in camp, but don't do it. Send him back to Finland. Well, they didn't. He looked pretty he he didn't as Rick likes to say, he didn't look out of place in that first 10 game tryout uh, at the beginning of the season. And so they kept him. Now, it worked out relatively well. Um he started being healthy, scratched a little bit towards the kind of two thirds mark through the season last year with some excuses from the head coach that he was fatigued or something like that, which was nonsense, but that's a story for another day. <laughs> right, right. So, th- so this year he comes in and yes, expectations are that just very Kotkaniemi is going to do what he did last year. Um, and unfortunately it just didn't work out that way. He's also had a couple of injuries this year. So suddenly his, production is stalled and with the injuries it's taking him some time to rebound pucks aren't going into the net he's not this big you know just every time he touches the puck the lamp lights kind of kid anymore and and the pressure I mean anyone who knows the Montreal media knows that it's it's a it's like you're under a microscope up there yeah um and so now yes they have sent him down to the AHL which to us is kind of the backwards way of doing it. Should have played another year in Finland, then come to Laval and started playing in the AHL and earned the NHL call-up. We we think that his development would have been much better. Keep in mind, too, you, you did mention he was drafted third overall. And when he was sent down about four weeks ago, the first thing I said on our podcast and on Twitter, and I took a lot of heat for it, was... This kid is valuable to Montreal, and every veteran in the AHL knows it. They are going to target him and welcome him with uh, big physical open arms to the AHL. And sure enough, he has been. In fact, uh, in the last game that he played uh, on Saturday, he was targeted aggressively all throughout the first period. He was put almost over the boards into the Cleveland Monsters bench, and he is now out indefinitely with a spleen injury. Oh, boy. Um, yeah. And that so that's exactly what you don't want to have happen to your to your third overall draft pick. Um I am always one for young players playing in the AHL for development, but you have to do it at the right time. And and you're absolutely correct. Montreal was completely backwards with it. Um Joel Faraby has worked out okay. And I think it's I think you're right. I think um spending some time in the AH some significant time in the AHL, um in his rookie season is a good thing. Um, it's working out okay that it didn't necessarily happen at the beginning of the season as, as you, as you suggested. And, and yeah, maybe he could have adjusted to things um, a little more quickly if he had done that, but, or who knows if he also is one that has high expectations. So maybe he would have taken it really hard if he didn't make, you know, if, if he wasn't up playing, playing in the NHL, so it's, it's, it's hard to judge, um, with someone like Faraby, but I, I, I think that he's, I think that he's doing okay. Yeah. He's, uh, he's got a lot of will. He's very grounded, mm-hmm. very mature for his age. And these are the X factors that you have to take into account. But uh, mm-hmm. if I had my druthers, I kind of side toward Ron Hextall's way of developing, like you were saying with uh, Kat Kanyemi, because if you're going to want these kids to put the puck in the net in a couple of years and it's a lot easier, but we'll, we'll see how it works out. And, and it, it speaks to what Fletcher talked about, about him getting offensive confidence, not having to worry about being the defensive forward on a particular line and right. getting power play time that he's not getting now. But uh, you know, the Flyers have a need, at least it's not the kind of need that Kakaniemi had to face Going into that market, which is like a, a meat grinder, <laughs> uh, third overall pick, uh, w- right. which was really, he was probably picked about, what, seven or eight spots higher than he probably should have. It was a need pick more than a value pick, in my humble opinion, and you may or may not agree, but. Um, oh, yeah, we were we were surprised when he when he was picked there. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So it, it, you just don't know. And the, the Flyers definitely were. You, you can't really blame them too much because they, even though they knew about Nolan Patrick and his headaches, they didn't think it would be a whole season thing, and nobody could have been, you know, nobody could have seen uh, what happened no. with Oscar Lindblom and that whole situation. So that's true. Yeah, that's a tough circumstance. 
Amy, uh, you have your hand in so many uh, tills here <laughs> with, with hockey. Uh, but yeah, before we uh, get you to talk a little bit about that, uh, just your Flyers impressions from afar, uh, taking a look, you know, from a different, uh, uh, you know, vantage point. Well, I, I, although I cover the the Flyers and the Canadians both, I am born and raised here in southeastern Pennsylvania, so I'm a Flyers fan when on the rare occasions I get to put a hat, hat on. So I can honestly say uh, I can't remember a season since 2010 that I was this energized and optimistic about where the mm-hmm. team's going. Um, and of, of course, since uh, since here at uh, Rocket Sports, we cover the Canadians, I always like to rub 2010 right in their faces since, <laughs> since we did beat them in the conference finals <laughs> that year. Um, but no, in all seriousness, I, I, I think Elaine Vigneault was absolutely the right pick to coach this team. Um, I really like his methodology. I think he's been a great fit. I like what uh, he and Fletcher did at the trade deadline. In fact, well, Nate Thompson came from Montreal. Uh, and as soon as, as soon as we heard that trade happen, I, I turned and said, absolutely. Nate, Nate Thompson's the right, he's going to fit right into Philadelphia, his style of game. He'll be perfect on the fourth line. Um, not, not mad about that trade uh, at all. Um, and I just really think that Vigneault is, you know, Vigneault came into the summer and came into training camp and we all know, we've all seen, we've seen it a thousand times, you know, his, his mantra was be an effing flyer. Right. He, knew, he knew from the get go playing against the flyers as often as he did when he, when he was coaching the Rangers, uh, he knows what this, what the, what the chemistry and and the makeup of this team in this city is, and he has, he's he's not going to accept not making the playoffs. He's not going to accept losing, and he's done everything that he can to make that happen. There have been times where it looked like it was slipping away, and he's managed to get this team to back together again. Losing JVR with a with an injury, not ideal at, right at this juncture, um, but but Giroux is fine. You know, Giroux's fine in the back of the net again. I think that's a big piece of the puzzle when you get him going. Um, they're kind of unstoppable. Carter Hart has been everything that uh, he <laughs> everything as build, um, and he's he's been their best player on the nights that they've needed him to be. Um, I think they're. They're, I, I think they're making the playoffs, and I think they're going to make a good run at it. And I'm excited about it. Yeah, yeah, every every reason to be. That's for sure. So, uh, Amy, you uh, you're you have several uh, ventures that you're involved with, like you just referred to. You you're with Rick on your podcast. What, what's uh, where can people find that? Well, we um, so all of all of the outlets that I mentioned are all under the Rocket Sports Media umbrella. Uh, so you can find us there on Twitter at Rocket Sports. Um, so as part of that, I am the lead correspondent for the AHL report, and that's where we cover uh, the Laval Rocket and the Lehigh Valley Phantoms, as well as uh, just prospects around the league in general and the American Hockey League in general. That's at the AHL report uh, on Twitter or AHLreport.com on the web. Uh, on the web. Um, and that's where you can find our podcast, which is called From the Press Box. It drops every Tuesday. So we'll be recording tomorrow. Um, and you can find that right there on our website. And so then aside, we have a dedicated Flyers uh, Twitter handle, which is at the Flyers Report. Um, so we're kind of, they're all, all sorts of different ones, but but they're all under the same umbrella. <laughs> Excellent. And I, you can find me at Flyers Rule. Flyers Rule. See, that's, that gives it away right there, who you root for, right? That's right. I was in, I've was been on Twitter for uh, 11 years now, so I was lucky enough to be an early adopter and snag that name pretty early on. <laughs> well, it's the name of our show tonight. After nine in a row, I had to go with that. I figured there was karma there. Flyers I love Rule it. with Flyers Rule. But uh, just before before you go, uh, just any quick update for Morgan Frost? We know he sustained an injury. I, I have not heard anything, to be honest. Um, so uh, keep an eye on our Twitter timelines. As soon as we hear anything, we will let you know. Excellent. At the AHL Report. Uh, you got it. At Rocket Sports and at the Flyer Report, the Flyers Report, to make sure I got to get that right. And, of course, at Flyers Rule. Amy, thanks so much for doing this. 
I guys, this was a blast. Uh, great questions, great conversation, and thanks so much for having me on. It was it was wonderful. I really appreciate it. Terrific. We'll see you down down uh, down the road. Thanks, guys. Right. Yeah, that was that was a lot of fun. Uh, some good information there, Chef. Your feedback. The Flyers at uh, the coach level that they are uh, understand the value of their prospects and the real realistic. Uh, expectations that they, they can get from them. Uh, obviously, we know the, the big three uh, that they get talked about all the time, but it's good to see that that the other ones are are well thought of, and at least the coach knows, uh, it seems at least Gordon, it seems like he's got a good handle of how to handle them. Right, right. And Dan, you're, you're usually at 80% of the, uh, the Phantoms home games, uh, just uh, your feedback. Yeah, I'm uh, there quite a bit, and uh, she's pretty spot on with with a vast majority of of what she came through, especially Morgan Frost. I know if you spend any amount of time on Flyers Twitter, there's always somebody clamoring to come back up or calling him Claude Giroux Jr. or something along those lines. And I, I just, I, you know, as somebody that's there, I watch him and I'm just never really overly impressed. You more often than not, I walk away thinking like that's it, you know, and I was at the game Friday night and that was the first time you had two goals and an assist. The team was just in an abysmal effort. Uh, this was like worse than Dave Haxtell era flyers. It was horrible, <laughs> but uh, uh, <laughs> he, he really looked like a man amongst boys that night. And it was the first time all season where I've been able to walk away from a game and think this kid's going to be something, you know? So it is good to see that he's finally there. He's obviously taken uh, a big steps from where he was in October, but you know, in terms of the hype train, you know, I don't know if a lot of these people that clamor for him, watch a lot of the phantoms and see what he's doing down there or they just look at his uh, his point totals because his point totals are impressive, but you know his p- overall play is not. It's the stuff, you know, his decision making, his play away from the puck, his defensive zone stuff that that kind of worried me. So I, I think she nailed a lot of that, and uh, obviously a lot of the other players that we've talked about as well. Maxim Shushko is another guy that I think has been under the radar really good this year. Uh, uh, you know, I don't know if he has an NHL future, like she was saying, but uh, as far as you know, potential under the radar prospects, he's right up there. Yeah. Yeah. So it's it's good to have that info uh, out there, and uh, yeah, we'll definitely have her back when uh, the Flyers had their uh, you know the uh, camp development camp and stuff like that. Uh, gents, um, we're not going to run through all the games tonight. There's just so much information. But just a reminder: since our last show, the Flyers uh, beat San Jose four to two. Another game that could have been a trap game, but uh, after a little bit of a rough start, they came through on that one. Then they beat that 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 back to back they had with the Rangers home and home, where uh, and, and you know the great thing about that game in New York, Carter Hart, who saved their bacon in the last game versus Buffalo, but out of the uh, twenty six or twenty three saves that he made out of twenty six, twenty two were considered what they call high danger, high quality chances. Because the Rangers, with, with some of that mad skill that they have, really put him to the test, and he came through. And I was another moment where I, I checked off in my mind, like, he's stopping these high-level chances, the type you're going to see against the best teams like Tampa and, and Boston. Oh, definitely. I thought, I, I like I said before, I don't know if it's that we were calling it, people, over last year people were calling drinking the Flyers Kool-Aid and all that stuff. I, give me some Kool Aid now. I'm in. You know, I'm ready to go. Let's do shots, for God's sakes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, uh, I'll go with the Southern Comfort myself. But anyway, so <laughs> so from there, the uh, the Flyers beat the Cash by the two. We talked about that. You know, Dan. One of the uh, tough parts of that game, you know, JVR breaks his fingers blocking a shot. He's out four to six weeks, which is why Joel Farabee got called up. Until that point, the Fletcher kind of wanted. Uh, Farabee to get a little more time you have to do what you have to do with the JVR out of the picture yeah I I think Farabee you know like we were talking about when she was on you know could have benefited from more AHL time you know much earlier in the year but I mean at this point I guess he's in he's in so it's fine I mean they're gonna miss JVR a little bit I guess you know he he did bring uh, some nice defense to the team and uh, occasionally chipped him some goals but 
you know, I think the team is overall solid enough for losing him. You know, I don't think he's one of the key pieces that they can, uh, you know, that if they lose him, they're going to be, you know, derailed. So I think they'll be fine in the long run. Uh, obviously, he and Farabee are two uh, different players, but. Again, getting more Farabee, uh, getting Farabee more experience this time of year, especially, you know, the playoff push and maybe even in the playoffs uh, could benefit him in the long run as well. Yeah, no, I think uh, by the first round of the playoffs, JVR should be there at least midway through the series. We'll see how that goes. Then, of course, next night we talked about how the Flyers had that superior effort against the Canes. A really great team win, one that we're, we're going to remember, especially if they have uh, – you know, a lot of success moving on from that. And, of course, uh, the last game. It was Drew, Carter Hart, and uh, a lot of passengers beating the Sabres 3-1. to one. Even uh, Jake Warchek, Shep, said that the Flyers didn't deserve to win that game. But uh, they're on a streak. They're on a roll. They believe. Well, that's, that, that's why you have Hart. And that's what a number one goalie does. He still games for you. And that's, you know, that's why... He, you sign them and you, you you know, a kid like this, you draft them, you prepare them for this, and he goes and gets you one or two games. He just outright steals them. So, hey, you can't, you can't complain. That's that's his job. That's what you want him there for, and it's, and it's a great thing. Yeah. Uh, you have an update on the Capitals game tonight. Do you have a score? It was... uh, yeah, one thing. It's – no, I got yeah, it's still two to nothing this two, second period. Two to nothing. So, so that yep. game is for uh, major implications. Right. So in a second. Yeah, so we're we're gonna be back next week after the Flyers play Boston at Tampa and at home versus the Minnesota Wild and the Edmonton Oilers. The Flyers are two and zero versus Boston. They're 0 2 0 versus uh, Tampa Bay, and they lost the game each in Minnesota and in Edmonton. And again, in fact, over the next eight games, opponents have a record of, I believe, 8 0 3 against the Flyers. So this is a bit of a gauntlet when you look at the schedule that's going to include uh, Boston, Tampa Bay, St. Louis, along with Nashville the Islander. But we'll be back halfway through those four games. With that, uh, Dan, any final thoughts? Uh, I mean, this week is going to be a a big proving ground here. You know, they made it through other teams in the Metro, you know, the Rangers and and Columbus and Florida and, you know, all these other teams that have uh, the playoff hopes and and potentials. They beat the Capitals and then they, you know, handled the the Hurricanes and Sabres. Now all of a sudden they're playing the two top teams in the East in Boston and Tampa. And, you know, this is going to be a big test to see if they can really truly hang with the big boys in the conference. Absolutely. Chef, the last item on our board is the NHL offside rules change. They've gone to a football style, breaking the plane without necessarily having to have your skate on the ice. I think that's a positive development. And you? Yeah, I think half the time you're getting pissed off thinking if if it was the other case, it would it would be fine. But yeah, I I, I don't feel either way towards it. I think it's a it's probably going to be better for the sport. But yeah, it's it's there for me. Yeah, it's there for me as well. Anyway, so yeah. Dan, uh, where can people find you on Twitter? Uh, at Dan the Flyer fan, at Brotherly Puck, at Brotherly underscore pod, and at Angry Negative. Yeah, and your next uh, podcast is? Uh, tomorrow night, we're doing a post-game Angry Negative show. Excellent, excellent. And, and Chef, uh, you're at Steam Pub, and where can people find you at Twitter? You can find me at Chef to the Left B at Twitter, and you can find me at Steam Pub. I'm there most of the time. All right, fantastic. And I'm Isaiah, I S A I A H underscore 520 on Twitter. If you want to yell at me and our uh, Twitter handle for the show, at OMB Puck, at OMB Puck, rate and subscribe. We appreciate the subscriptions, moves us up the charts when people are looking for Flyers podcast. On your favorite platform, you can give us a five-star rating. We appreciate it. And with that, lots of info tonight. Until next week, take care.